Now that we've covered Charlotte's web, let us now discard it like one of Charlotte's older webs and put up a crappy replacement. As requested, we're doing Charlotte's Web 2, Wilbur's Great Adventure. It's not so hard to be a pig. You just start in by eating big. You snort your meal and squeal and roll in mud and slurp and burp. <clears throat> Eat rotten apples. If E.B. White thought that the first movie was disappointing, well, he'd probably not like this one even more. Because really, what else could be told in this story-verse that White didn't think to do beforehand? Now like I mentioned, the first movie getting a comeback in the 90s meant a new generation of people would be exposed to it. Which means it would last just long enough for companies like Paramount and Universal Studios to want to make use of the IP in 2003. Nine years since its comeback! and produce a sequel while Disney was still on the let's make a sequel out of all our old animated movies train. The film was directed by Mario Peluso, who while best known for being like a storyboard artist or designer for many TV shows, he also has directed and produced some material, including episodes for New Kids on the Block, The Halloween Tree, wait that's actually a good movie from what I hear, and also Stripperella. I can't really say much for some of his work, but even still, just what exactly could they possibly do to add to the Charlotte's Web story? Well, if Universal can do it to the land before time, I'm sure they'll pull something out of their butt for this. So, let's see what Wilbur's Great Adventure is all about. Why'd you do this for me, Charlotte? Because you've been my friend. And friendship is a tremendous thing. Okay, nothing too bad so far. At least the backgrounds are detailed and colorful. Templeton seems fine here, and the animal designs seem fairly done. Well, it's when the talking begins that you start to notice a change. Oh, please, Nelly, reconsider. This isn't such a good idea. In fact, it's a terrible idea. No more crazy stunts. Oh. Please, you're gonna hurt yourself! Oh, you're just a big old worrywart, Wilbur. I've never even been to Nintendo before. Oh, no. Alright, so, Wilbur being a bit smaller than he was at the end of the first movie and having some more noticeable fur, fine. It's not too bad looking, but what the hell is this? Why do Charlotte's children have head hair? You can't really say it's like Charlotte's, since they're supposed to be Trichobothria, that while animated might look like a hairstyle, but it's just to make her design more appealing. Here, it just feels uncanny for them to not only have different hairstyles, but different hair color as well. Also, while in the first movie, the children looked closer to being like barn spiders like their mother, here they apparently have undergone a mutation into like centaurs, since they have an extra set of arms to go with their legs. All for what? Just to tell them apart? Why not just make subtle changes to the top of their heads while keeping close to their original body design like in the first movie? Either way, those faces just creep me out. So the redhead is named Nelly, who is very courageous and happens to be voiced by Amanda Bynes. You know. I'm gonna hit you in the head with a head. <laughs> Andy McAfee, who you remember from Tom and Jerry the movie, voices Joy, and Myra Bamford voices Arania. Wilbur is apparently voiced by David Barron, who has made his time playing Ma Chao in many of the Dynasty Warrior games. I will say, some of these actors have been in some Nickelodeon programs. Appropriate, considering this was animated, not just by Universal and Paramount, but also Nickelodeon Studios! That might explain some of the different designs we have going. What part of never ever bite your father, don't you understand? I think they're kind of cute. Really? 
Come on, they, they do have those sweet little smirks and uh, uh, smiles. I think Charlie Adler is trying to combine both Ed and Bev Bighead voices into the same character. It's kind of amusing, which isn't saying much about everything else, though. Like, why is Wilbur suddenly more skittish around most everyday occurrences? Why are most of the animals assholes now? Before it was just Ram and Templeton, and now it's spread to a larger variety. Did you hear? Did you hear? Ha ha! It's officially started! Springtime! There's action all over the bar! Wait, you mean it's been a year since the first movie? Well, that sure does mean that Charlotte's children are dead! Or should be old widows, since barn spiders normally live for about a year. But hey, we're now operating purely on cartoon animal logic and not have some grounded animal rules like the first movie. You know what else this movie has that wasn't in the first? A villain! Ooh, a little goose pate. Closer, that's it. Well, I guess we know who the adventurous one is. Did you hear? Oh, it's the worst, absolutely worst news! Barley the Fox just hit the hen house! What? For nieces, I think. Or maybe Carol's. What the rotten thief! Oh! Poor little egg. I better keep a sharp, sharp eye on my little ones in case that scoundrel comes back. You didn't seem to mind that one cat who tried eating Templeton last time. Yeah, it sucks he took some of your children. But you all know too well the rules of nature. Foxes need to eat too, and unfortunately, they might find it easier to hunt in unsecured farms. But oh, it's fine because Farley does have a rather pompous and evil personality, so it works. It's a kid's movie, so I shouldn't be too upset, but they spent the first movie establishing how everyone but Wilbur accepted the cycle of life and death, and there was nothing about actually evil animals. But enough of that. We get introduced to our character in need of help for the movie, Cardigan, voiced by Harrison Chad. Can you guess what else he was in? Wanna play? Wanna play? <laughs> I'm good to go. Whoa! Oops! I think I made this guy too big and too strong. And the sad thing is, we don't even see his mother. We don't even know how he got to this point. Was he just born? Has it been a day or so? Why are they shunning him like this? Because he has black wool? Why are even the adults laughing whenever he fumbles about? He's a kid! Are they really pulling a because he's different he must be shunned thing? Despite the friendship song in the first movie saying that appearances don't matter? Did they just flat out forget that? The only one willing to befriend him is Wilbur. If only because no one but Charlotte would play with him last time. By the way, you know how the first movie at least had music by the Sherman Brothers, so they come off as catchy and have memorable tunes? It's not so hard to be a pig. You just start in by eating big. You snort your meal and squeal and roll in mud and slurp and burp. <clears throat> eh, very bland now. Hey kids, you know the best way to become friends? Just learn to be like a pig. You know, the same humble, radiant, terrific pig that had to get help from a friend just to live. Well, now he's helping another get friends since he isn't going to die anymore. This whole movie is just way too cheery compared to the first one. There it was balanced to a point where children could be entertained but still learn meaningful stuff, while here it's trying to be mostly entertaining, but it's not doing it well. So one of the subplots in this is that Fern is attempting to enter a tomato growing contest, and her solution to growing the biggest tomato? I've got a top secret, never been used before, growing strategy. <laughs> Naturally. Wilbur's manure pile. Well, if this film wasn't already smelly, how about a possibly unintentional innuendo? Oh, I don't get it. I was sure the low-carb, high-fat diet would do the trick. Wanna suck on a leg? I mean, yeah, it's a fly, but there's a line that I feel should never be said around anyone. Also, damn, September time, and that tomato is huge. 
So not a whole lot has happened since Wilbur befriended Cardigan, but with the fair coming up, Wilbur can't help but think about his long-departed friend. Tell us again about our mom. Please, Wilbur? It's kind of funny, really. When I first met Charlotte, I thought she was kind of, well, kind of bloodthirsty, eating all those flies and gnats, and, and then there were those moths. Ugh. But, but, but I was wrong. She was smart and loyal. My best friend. And she, too, was apparently a mutant with head hair. Seriously, did they just forget what the animal characters looked like or care that they're not being accurate at all? So both Wilbur and Cardigan get to go to the fair, as do the Spider Girls and Templeton. Also, while I thought that perhaps this was a year since the first movie, it might actually just be the same year as when it ended, since they treat this fair like it's the second time he goes. Yet they still had to treat the start of spring like it just now happened, despite it starting at the end of the first- you know what, screw it. Wilbur gets pressured into thinking he might end up as a meal. Through a song sequence. Because people expect more web messages, but knowing Charlotte's dead, this might lead to a change in Zuckerman's mind. Nothing else ever comes of this. It gets dropped after a while. He does ask her children, but nothing much comes to mind. Also, Cardigan is being sold off to another farmer, meaning he's losing another friend to the dreaded fair. But hey, Fern won first place in her contest. But nothing to do about Cardigan. Time to move along. Worried about him, Wilbur wants to visit him, but doesn't know how to get to his farm, and is probably too afraid to go on his own. So, after doing some random... thinking, he thought he could think like Charlotte would, he learns where to go from Gwen the Goose, and convinces Templeton to guide him there. I would consider it a personal favor. Oh, you expect old Templeton to save your bacon, is that it? <laughs> Well, Cardigan's your problem. I have enough headaches of my own. Stop it! <laughs> stop it! Ed, will you stop roughhousing with the kids and give me a foot massage? I guess I could babysit your baby rats. Tempting? But forget it. Well, he's out. So that night, he and the girls trek out alone in the big scary cornfield where everything has a face. There is only about 40 minutes left in the movie. Can we please pick this up? So despite saying no earlier, Templeton changed his mind and agrees to help Wilbur if he promises to babysit his kids. Along the way, Wilbur ends up eating some blackberries. And if you've noticed, he has been getting really dirty the further along they went, and now he's become a wild pig. Guess that one dingo cartoon was right about how wild pigs are made. Well, they finally make it to the damn farm, and what follows after Cardigan figures out it's him? Padding! Hey, hey, lower the volume, would ya? I'm trying to make some milk here. Sorry, Bessie. I don't want the quality of my milk to be affected because you got a big mouth, got it? And nothing's gonna affect the quality of your milk, Bessie. It's always sour, like your personality. <laughs> because we really needed to learn about how sour one of the cows' milk is. Also, she becomes another friend. Oh, and Cardigan doesn't want to be sheared, which means I guess Wilbur is planning to stay with him until he does. He never gets sheared in this movie. And oh right, I forgot they introduced a villain. Polly, my friend. We are looking good today. How delightful. Do you see what I see? I see a crappy movie with a very self-absorbed fox. Seriously, this is the main conflict for the rest of the movie. This sly and rather hungry fox, who by the way is voiced by Rob Paulson, that the movie just treats as a generic bad guy who only exists to eat. Oh, 
It's great to be an intellectual. Oh, you're the smart kind of evil fox, eh? We'll just see about that. So, as he goes in to steal a chicken, Wilbur and friends find out and pretty much try to convince Wilbur to stop Farley. Which he does. After he gets spooked by a rake. <gasps> Get out! Get out of here! Ah, uh, I think you have me confused with the big bad wolf. God, I wish I was watching Hoodwinked right now. I could use a little Patrick Warburton in here. Well, he fails to stop Farley from escaping. And as a result, the farm lady thinks Wilbur is a wild pig trying to get her hens. Good thing they aren't good at tracking him down. Everybody's mad at me. They think you're a wild pig on the loose. Me? Wild? That's ridiculous. I'm not wild. I'm very well mannered. Yeah, well, you better take a good look at yourself. Look at myself? Oh, boy. I do look like a wild pig. No crap! There's no way of getting it off, and it'll be hard to leave knowing the word got out about him. So he comes up with a way to have the girls weave a web to say that it was Farley who took one of the hens, even though we didn't see him take one. Which means until they get done, he has to hide out here. Which means another freaking song sequence. Come on girls, we can do it. We can spin a web the way our mother did. Get serious, Nellie. Come on, girls, nothing to it. After all, each one of us is Charlotte's kid. Yes, but you didn't know her at all because she died. Skipping ahead, they fail at making any kind of phrase, meaning they'll have to hide all day and put up with that annoying dog. You don't understand. Calm down, motor mouth. Uh -oh. Here we go again. Whoa. Ugh, where's Colette when you need her? Despite their low effort in hiding him, Wilbur gets found, which means the humans begin going after him. But by having to leave, that means Cardigan becomes the new target for Farley. Now Wilbur has to go rescue him, and they track him down to some old abandoned property? Lamb chops. Always tender. Stay away! Leave me alone! Oh, really? Now what kind of host would that make me? To ignore my guest? Let me show you my... How shall I put this? Hospitality. Why couldn't you just take him somewhere, suffocate him to death, and then bring him here to eat? When the predator catches its prey, they don't let go till they make the kill. Otherwise, this can happen. <laughs> Intellectual my ass. It's okay, though. He couldn't even get out. Now he'll surely die, right? Unless the next ten minutes include Wilbur going berserk on Farley for revenge, I doubt it. Well, now even Zuckerman gets called in by the other farmers to chase after the wild pig, just as our heroes arrive at the place to try and save Cardigan. Fern, who earlier was looking for Wilbur back at his home, ends up arriving at the Hirsch farm since she believes he might be there. Guess she'll be relevant? Whatever, time to break in. <laughs> Just when I got a good beat, go! With three studios working on this thing, you'd at least hope for some continuity with that door. But nope! Templeton actually had the balls to come help, since he has a vendetta against foxes in general. Oh, but not Charlotte for sicking the cat on you. And with the others, they actually catch Farley in a trap. And that's pretty much it for him. They rescue Cardigan, the Spider-Girls weave a message that says the fox did everything, 
Just in time, too, as they corner Wilbur and Furness to actually reveal it's him. And they find Farley and presumably kill him off screen. So as the movie winds down, Wilbur says he'll try to visit whenever he can. Arania and Joy decide to stay with Cardigan to keep him company. And of course, we still have babysitting to do. Oh, Templeton, there you are. You gotta do something. A deal's a deal, Wilbur. <laughs> Henrietta, what did I say? No jumping. Where's your brother? Oh no, Ralphie? Ralphie? Oh. Templeton! Well, this movie certainly added something. A whole lot of nothing. Just what good was this, other than to make sequel money like Disney? It really can be difficult to continue with a character's personal growth after accomplishing a major arc the first time around, which is probably why they just raised their arms and said, eh, let's just make a silly animal movie with this. I'm sure some kids will like it. And yeah, I know not every movie has to be Pixar, they at least should be entertaining without it lowering the bar too much. This feels like they lowered the bar too low from what the first movie set, since they didn't know what to do with it. It's painfully childish with how characters treat each other. What, how they easily shun a child for looking different? Then, of course, the dropping of topics like Wilbur's death anxiety returning with Charlotte gone, and Cardigan needing shearing while Wilbur's around. The only thing they actually follow through with is the stuff with Farley. And Rob Paulson does try with him to be entertaining, just as Charlie Adler does with Templeton. But they don't do enough to really salvage it. The animation is... okay. But certain designs still feel wrong and unnecessary. Seriously, what were they thinking with the spiders? Considering other sequels like this that were unneeded, this one isn't the worst in terms of screwing over the original continuity, but it's pretty much forgettable. It's a sham of a movie that forgets everything the first movie did in favor of boring humor, characters, and story. I'd say this was a sad end to Charlotte's Web, but fortunately in 2006, Nickelodeon, along with Paramount and other studios, would come together to make a live-action adaptation to the original Charlotte's Web novel. And apparently it did pretty well, both commercially and with critics. I haven't seen that one yet, but maybe I will at a later date. Next time, we continue Patreon Month with another webcomic involving werewolves. So let's hope that one turns out better than the disappointment that this web weaved. 